One of the most important events in American history is the Emancipation Proclamation, a moment in time when a large contingent of the American conscience woke up to the promise of its founding fathers, that all men are created equal. Other Americans didn't agree, and for them, slavery was the greatest material interest in the world. The proclamation that outlawed slavery and freed all those who were in servitude came much after the beginning of the American Civil War in 1861. But it also didn't reflect the true struggle between the polarities of a pseudo-industrial North and the labor-intensive industries of the South. The proclamation was a document of high moral and ethical ground, yet it had no room or sympathy for the beliefs, mentalities, and humanity of the Confederacy, the 11 rebellious Southern states. Its words were merely a confirmation of what the South had expected to happen upon Abraham Lincoln's election into office, and in the behavior of the Northern states in legislating controls on slavery and its expansion. The Civil War was a terrible consequence of the ideals found within the proclamation that were forced by one people upon another people, thereby leading to a devastating war that saw families divided, fighting on opposite sides, a nation torn into two, and over a million Americans killed. Islam had its proclamation moment, but Islam had much greater foresight that could have in turn significantly and beneficially guided the likes of Lincoln and the Union in their ambitions to end slavery. Islam was much wiser in recognizing the moment and the context. The main industry in pre-Islam Arabia was trade and commerce. A great part of that trade and commerce was founded on slavery. In fact, the sourcing and trading of slaves as an industry itself was one of the main enterprises. There was no denying this. There was also the cultural and ancestral momentum that trumped even the economic benefits of slavery. Slavery had existed for eons. By that moment in time, not one religion, nation, or visionary thinker, be them of classical antiquity or beyond, had criticized the idea of slavery. Consequently, Islam understood that any clean-cut law abolishing the enterprise of slavery on moral ground alone would not be the solution. On the contrary, it would require an ingenious system to slowly but surely end slavery in a gradual and diminishing manner. Islam's position on slavery was unequivocal. Granted, in neither the Qur'an nor the Hadiths is there any definite statement outlawing the practice outright. Yet what Islam did do is established a clear-cut plan to cancel the concept of slavery in its entirety, from both a belief system perspective by promoting slavery as morally wrong, and from an Islamic law system that would regulate the do's and don'ts of slavery, thereby resulting in a great exponential reduction of the slave population. Slavery's eradication needed this phased approach, as was done with other elements that needed to be prohibited at the time, such as the consumption of alcohol. But before we get to how Islam structured its strategy for the banning of slavery, let us explore how in pre-Islam, the supply of slaves was conducted, as this element has a direct relevance to the solutions henceforth proposed by the religion. There were several methods to the supply of slaves across the Arabian Peninsula. First and foremost were wars and the raiding of other tribes, and the subsequent capture of prisoners and introducing them into the slave populations. Kidnapping of free men, women, and children to then sell them off into servitude was another common approach. The impregnating of many concubines and birthing of many children to then be sold off into the slave trade was a very practical and reliable supply chain for slave traders. The final method was the sale of one's own family members due to the circumstances of debt or poverty by senior members of that same family. And so if we look at wars and the resultant prisoners who were primed for slavery, one Islamic law, actually one new Islamic law, recognized that no prisoner shall be taken from any nation or empire that does not itself convert Muslim captives into slaves. A second new law explained how a soon-to-be-conquered land or people could in advance purchase their freedom as part of a surrender, and hence this same quid pro quo system became common throughout all Muslim conquests in the future. 
Islam further laid the grounds within the Qur'an and its laws with concepts like al-mukataba, meaning correspondence. And that's when a slave was allowed to buy out their own freedom from their master through self-paid manumission, by either working for their master or others over a specific period of time. Masters could never deny this claim by the slave, while this claim also granted the slave extra rights and privileges. A free man's children from a slave, be he Muslim or any other creed, were free from birth. Unlike how in the early 19th century, the slave children of many American slave owners like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and others were confined eternally to slavery. One key law that saw a play on the conscience of Muslims was the linkage of the emancipation of slaves with a prioritized method of charity and virtue for any Muslim. The freeing of slaves was a moral duty that was looked upon greatly and favorably by Allah. The same charitable system also applied in war when leaders and generals would grant the entire vanquished enemy, armies and populations, mercy and freedom within the dhimmi system. This intricate and comprehensive system that Islam introduced intended to treat slaves as people, not as chattel, to gradually diminish slavery's population, to reduce the problem within a short period of a few generations, without the need for spilling blood or the enforcement of ideals by one belief system over that of another. So what happened? Muslims failed on this part of Islam. Muslims chose to continue on with slavery over their rightful duty. As their dependence on slavery as a trade and business continued on well into the 20th century. Muslims prioritized their industry over their faith's teachings, abandoning their moral high ground. Sadly, the reverse happened. As Muslims expanded across the known world, the enterprise would see an explosion in scale, spearheaded by the Umayyads who recognized slavery as necessary for their aspirations in building their empire. Centuries later, the Ayyubids went a step further and began a process of buying thousands, if not tens of thousands of slaves from across Eastern Europe and especially the Slavic regions. The Ayyubids mainly utilized them as slave armies for military engagement up until a contingent of slave Caucasian and Turkish generals and their battalions revolted and eventually became the leaders of their own Muslim nation, the Mamluk Sultanate. Slavery continued on with its expansion in further iterations of Islamic empires and nations and with the Ottoman Empire, we saw how slavery infiltrated every aspect of society. In the royal courts, in the military, in concubinage, in commerce, and in agriculture. And only in the 19th century do we start to see slavery's gradual cosmetic curtailing. Again, not due to Muslim moral conviction, but due to pressures from newly enlightened European powers. And this failure in applying Islam's teachings continued on much in the same unjust ways. Muslims didn't live up to or attempted to apply this calculated system of Islamic law that would rid them of this inhumane practice called slavery. Slavery would continue on well into the latter parts of the 20th century with nations like Yemen, Oman and Mauritania being the last to abolish slavery in the 1960s and 1970s. One thing we can do, though, is that we can't compare the Arab and Muslim world's delayed reaction towards slavery to the Western world's outlawing of slavery in the same way. It's assumed or taken for granted that slavery was abolished in the developed world like Great Britain and France because of a new moral awakening or human rights play in the late 18th and 19th century. It's no coincidence that the abolition of slavery in Europe came hand in hand with the moment when slave labor was not as critical during the era of the Industrial Revolution. The Western nations discovered that it was much too expensive and bad for business to own one's own slaves. They could hire them instead. Therefore, these nations found it the opportune moment to claim moral high ground and force others who were still dependent on the slave industry for their means of production and labor by abolishing slavery. The crazy part here is that these same European nations would then go on to enslave the free people of foreign nations around the world through their suppressive colonialism. Slavery was considered as a cultural phenomenon, a habit as old as time. Regardless in any shape or form, it was and is intolerable. 
Many Muslims and Arabs will defend their version of slavery as a kinder and more benevolent version when compared to others around the world. Maybe so, but ultimately, it isn't. Slavery, as I said, in every iteration, is bad. The point I am making is that Islam was not racist. Yes, it didn't outlaw slavery outright, but it also never condoned slavery. It put certain measures that, if applied, would have diminished slavery to infinitesimal figures when compared to that of what it was and to what it became. This responsibility rested on Muslims' shoulders to transcend, to embrace their proclamation moment and to have led the world away from such an inhumane phenomenon, slavery. Nothing can be done now but to accept this dark Muslim history, to accept the shortcomings, and most importantly, to make sure that the wisdoms and laws put in place by Islam regarding the freedoms of all people are never put into question again.